This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Our first full slate of college football for this year is finally on the horizon. It is week number one. We're going to break it down from a betting perspective with Dr. Ed Fang and Parker Fleming to get you ready for what should be a fun slate of college football. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as I am every week to break down college football by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work at thepowerrank.com. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. Ed, happy new year to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Start of college football, but I'm sure I'm not doing quite as well as you were doing on Saturday in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, yeah, the the concessions could not take credit cards. They could not. It was a cashless uh, situation, so it was free concessions. Um, they ran out of beer, so I had to have like a weird gin and tonic and wine combination, which was uh, odd to say the least. But hey, uh, the the truest gift was served up by Scott Frost. So. Truly grateful for that. Had an absolute blast in Ireland. Shocked that he got on the plane afterwards. But hey, you know, um, after throwing his entire staff under the bus, just, just great stuff all around. Um, I had a blast. Um, so happy to be back. But honestly, exceeded all expectations. The stadium was sweet. Dublin was cool. People were awesome. Nebraska fans were really cool to us, too. So That's I had a great old time. Yeah. That's what they say. Yeah, I'd experienced that in Lincoln, too. Like, they, I was at the game where they won on a Hail Mary against Northwestern, and they were like, as we're leaving the stadium, like, oh, have a great year, guys, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, this is kind of weird. I I, I appreciate the Midwest niceness, but uh, a little... Honestly, they were great, though. So huge fans of Nebraska fans, uh, and I hope that they have better fortunes going forward. I mentioned we have Parker Fleming on the show for today. We had Parker on last year as well, previewing, I think it was the ch- the conference championships, I believe. Uh, you can find Parker on Twitter at Stats o War. You can check him out, all of his work, his fun graphs at cfb grasscom You can also get his betting insights at the Bet US College Football Show over on YouTube, Parker, it is a delight to have you back on the show for today. How are you doing in week one? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing great, man. I, I snuck in a little week zero vacation last week. Got to go out in the mountains and hang out and just, uh, you know, post up at a cabin and, and watch some games kind of unencumbered by responsibilities. So uh, that was really nice. Feeling refreshed, feeling ready for this um, season. I was going to ask you about the free concessions. That was my that was on my list because I know you're at the game. Uh, yeah. I can't believe they gave it away. I was at the Alamo Bowl in like 2015 and they ran out of concessions and they were like, nah, we're just not serving anything anymore. <laughs> like we're just not we're, like our, our, our cards aren't working, but we're not giving you anything for free. What? That's wild. Like, uh, so we, like I was kind of annoyed because like I was there before kickoff and I was like, you know, I, I got to the front of the line and they were like, hey, our, our you know, as the line's going really slow and I missed like interest. And I love like watching interest. And I wanted to like see the, the teams on the field. And I was like annoyed that I missed it. Then we got to the front and they're like, hey, it's free. And I was like, okay, I'm okay with this now. I can live with this. I also <laughs> got to miss the first Nebraska touchdown. So the feeling of dread was like, I watched it on a screen in the concession line. So honestly, it couldn't have worked out any better. Uh, again, I'm not going to recommend necessarily like a tiny whiny and a gin and tonic at a football game. Gin and tonic. Otherwise, yes. Uh, at a football game, maybe not. But, you know, it was it was great. Uh, a lot of fun out there. Again, cannot say enough good things about the Nebraska fans. They're legitimately extremely cool. And uh, again, I hope they find better fortunes. Going I mean, forward. But it was fun. It seriously takes a serious level of uh, I don't I don't even know how to say it. A serious level of awareness, goodness. Yeah. Yes. To <laughs> to uh, what? Zero and nine in one score games now since the beginning of last season. Yeah, um, and there know. was the stat that they were like um, they had a positive um, point differential across their past nine games, despite winning one game in that time. And that was also against Northwestern. We can ignore that part, right? Um, that's right. <laughs> but like you add in like the honestly, the onside kick was fine. I don't. I have no objections to that. I had but like to do. I, I actually. Yeah, that, I actually do have a really strong objection there just philosophically in terms of like win probability. I I think at that point they were up so much that they, they were the favorite. They were the favorite going in. The game was playing out about like what the expectations were and onside kick is not like going for it on fourth down. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like uh, going for two or something. It is a high variance, low probability event. Right. And it felt a little bit to me like Scott Frost was trying to just put a feather in his cap by right. doing something funky after all the talk of special teams last year, and it just bit him in the behind. And so I I, I don't necessarily 
Like I understand, Hey, you're right. It, it, it can be a surprise. Like that's a, that's an actual strategy. And the fact that it went poorly is not what I have the expectation or the, sure. the problem with. It's that low probability, high variance. When you're the favorite minimize variance, dude, Write that bad uh, yeah. boy out, go home, take the W Scott Frost. And it seemed like he was not content to take the W that was given to him. That's a very well, fair point. You should be going for low variance when you are a, Almost two touchdown a, 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 a favorite, I guess not a close, but like at one point, and you're up by 11, two scores. That does make sense, you know, going with the yeah. the lower variance approach. Ed, you had but, something there too? But that requires understanding the word variance, which I'm not sure <laughs> actually happened or happens much in the world of sports. And I would just like to say they still should have won the game. Yeah. Even after yeah. it goes wrong, you're still up. So um, I don't know. I, I, I think... I mean, Northwestern, I mean, Jim, you got to be thrilled that 536 yards or however many was, uh, you know, after how <laughs> decrepit the offense was last year. I remember like um, when I and saw only, and only 529 of those came after the catch on screen. So, you know, right. they had seven honest to God yards and the rest of it was just Nebraska not tackling. Right. And like, I remember when Helinski, like he, he had this like celebratory, like post on his Instagram page saying that he won the job. And like, I root for him because, you know, like the, the stuff he's gone through, I want him to be successful and, you know, have a good time. But it's like, do we really want to run it back? You know, do you want to go for like this again? Or do you want to like go for a retro freshman and see what, what happens there? And I was like, okay, you know, whatever. But like, he kicked butt, man. I know a lot of it was because the offensive line is good. Like you said, the yak was good, bad tackling, but like they were great. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. Um, it was fun to see a lot of purple weird. Like there were more fans there than there would have been at the game. We're in Evanston, which is super, super odd. Uh, and the ratio is better than it would have been in Evanston too. So just a odd stuff all around, uh, and a, a fun game for sure. We're going to talk about week number one in just a second here with both Ed and Parker and get their insights on this week. But, in, uh, but the first NFL kickoff still a few weeks away, you can still get on the action now on FanDuel Sportsbook with their NFL super win bonus right now. Anyone who places at least a $50, Super Bowl winner bet will get back five dollars for each win their team has during the regular season. There are a ton of other futures markets available, like team win totals, division winners, player props, and so much more. There's no better place to get ready for football season than on FanDuel, America's number one sports book and official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and president select states only. Bonus issued is non withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max free bet $50. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Connecticut. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 109 with it. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. In Wyoming, 1-800-522-4700. Or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's dive in here week number one. And Parker, let's talk to you about this, the weird set of circumstances we have here. Because we talked to you last year. Like I said, it was the conference championships. We had basically all the data we were going to get. This is a very different situation. We've got basically preseason priors as the the building blocks of our betting models for week one. So what process do you go through in formulating those preseason priors with your model that you use each week? Yeah, I feel like I've explained this a lot this this year just because people are asking so much more about this. I think that kind of as betting has gotten popular, people are a little more skeptical of early season data. And I think the big selling point that I have is every model has to start somewhere, right? If you don't have preseason priors, you're saying all teams are the same. That is actively and aggressively wrong, right? And so my preseason priors might be wrong but they're going to be at least in the right direction better than just saying all teams are the same. So um, the way I do that is, is, is just a combination of, of uh, coaching continuity, recent performance, and, um, and, and some of those returning production numbers like Bill does such a, Bill Conley does such a great job putting those out and, and letting people use them. Um, and you know, that, that, those aren't necessarily my ideal, but in terms of what I have time and what's feasible and what does pretty well for me historically, those, those let me kind of link, coaches and seasons uh, and, and teams across uh, across seasons. So all I do is just kind of have, you know, an effect for the coach, an effect for the program, because there's a lot of 
um, unobservables that about a program that can kind of speak to, you know, development cycles, how some uh, Northwestern's a great example of, you know, I'm not projecting them to be at the top of the Big Ten every years, every, every year, but every two to three years, we should expect their, their talent to kind of coalesce at the top of the development cycle. So I take that into account. And, um, and uh, it's, it's been a little nice. It was a little weird with the COVID year and kind of the eligibility last year. It feels like we're a little bit returning to normal with being able to project those. Uh, but I will say I, I toss those out pretty quickly. I phase them out is probably the better word. I let teams tell me who they are. Um, but just try and link teams year to year gives me a little bit more of an expectation of a team who performed last year and either did or didn't change their coach and has this much returning production generally performs this well the next year. So with the coaching continuity, like how much have you found that that matters? Um, I, I, honestly, yeah, it's it's not as much. I know there are people who do like individual coaching effects, and I don't know how well those are identified. Um, I, I, th th there's a lot going on in that coefficient. Um, the, the coaching to me did, did significantly improve kind of the year to year. I, I, I really thought that with like the unobservable of just the team, I would kind of capture that, but including a specific coaching effect and or a, a specific coaching continuity just wasn't the same coach as last year. Um, that, that is obviously a little bit, um, collinear with your, um, returning production and, and with how you did last year, right? Like worst teams are probably not going to have coaching continuity unless they're developing upwards. So, um, right. uh, it, it, it the, in terms of total effect size, not great, but in terms of making me feel good about it, um, not, you know, not just throwing random numbers out there and reporting random numbers like their actual effects. I think having it in the model, one, improves my performance, but two, helps me better understand uh, what, what the other effects are, are saying as well. Yeah, and not to beat Scott Frost like a dead horse, but he did make some changes, uh, brought in Mark Whipple from Pitt, which, which was something that, like, are you considering how good Whipple was at Pitt or is it just like binary, there's no continuity. So that's an effect. How good was Mark Whipple at Pitt? Is it <laughs> um, because you question. could argue, yeah, like looking at Kenny Pickett's development, you know, he had like a QBR sub 60 for three years and then had 99.1 in his fourth year, the yep. year that he had the Blitnikoff wide receiver and he had Brennan Marion as his inside wide receivers coach and Pat Narduzzi actually let them pass the ball. And uh, the ACC had a really down year. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on and moving all that to say, by um by accounting for head coach, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, by having that year over year and by having that by school, I mean, it's not a precise estimate. I'm not I'm not really ready to say, you know, Mark Whipple is worth 1.724 wins or whatever, but to say, hey, generally, uh, I expect some aspects of his performance to carry over. And in the case of Nebraska, to kind of positively regress, help 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 them positively regress from some of the the flukiness of the special teams and the offensive inconsistency and the one score losses. Hmm. Is that something you want to add in eventually, like having an effect for each coach? Because I know that like there are, we talked to Drew Dinzik, a whale capper, about the NFL stuff when John Gruden got fired. And he's like, okay, like this actually is worth like a negative for their team. And that would work for yours as well, because the continuity thing is also a factor there as well. But is that an aspiration for you long term to have some sort of like effect? Or is that not entirely realistic to, to, to be able to separate, parse out, uh, you know, cause and effect on that kind of stuff? Yes. Yeah, so my background is causal inference and oh, I good. get very skeptical. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're I, well positioned to answer that say, question, basically. Yeah. I don't want to say anything negative about people's methods. Like stuff works sure. and there's good insight to sure. get even from correlational data. Um, in terms of the additional predictive power uh, in understanding how a team year to year is going to go, uh, especially given that like phasing out those predictions pretty well, pretty easily. I, I don't know there's additional power um, from the coaches and teams I've talked to. I, I've done a little bit of modeling to identify coaches who are outperforming as potential hires. Uh, yeah. Again, some of that work is just let's let's put some numbers behind some some uh, preconceived notions. Long term, yes, absolutely, man. If I could if I could wrangle my team of interns and and get them to get the data, some of that is just you know managing the data and and making sure that I could stay on top of all that. But um, uh, it, it really, I think the aggregate team effect and the year over year effect really captures that, and then teams kind of tell us who they who they are. Okay, so we talked about my purple. Let's talk about your purple quick before we dive into uh, the 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 big games in week number one. We got TCU facing off against Colorado. TCU thirteen and a half point favorites. Uh, Parker, you don't need to give us like betting analysis here. I just want to know what's the vibe heading into twenty twenty two for you and TCU. Um, I, I, it feels like, uh, of course, for people who don't know, Gary Patterson coached there forever. It kind of spiraled out of control last uh, last fall, and he he uh, 
uh, step down or was asked to step down, depending on who you ask. And uh, Sunny Dykes takes over. Uh, I, I linked it to being akin to being in college and having a real grinder of a semester. And, you know, it's like November of a semester where you have two 8 a.m.s and really a lot of homework and it's rough. And you think, man, come January, I'm going to get my life together. My first class is going to be at 10 a.m. I've got optimism and have a social life. I'm going to get better grades. It's going to be awesome. There's that like whiff of freshness that TCU has not had for years. And so I think um, uh, even stuff like Gary Patterson was very, very cagey about letting other teams see what practice was going on. And Sonny Dex has had, you know, open practices, had videos of players. They're, they're telling jokes with each other while they're sitting in the ice um, baths after uh, af after practice. And that's all new to TCU fans. So there really is this kind of jubilance, this excitement and hope um, that like, it's okay to root for a team and it can be fun. Um, I think the expectation is that the offense should be, um, uh, you know, really, really good in terms of efficiency, really bad in terms of sequencing last year should be much more potent this year. Even if the defense is a little rockier, I think given the way that TCU has been the last couple of years, really inconsistent on offense and, and defense to, to varying degrees, um, Scoring a whole lot of points will go a long way towards making fans in Fort Worth really happy. If Sonny Dykes can get to a bowl this year, I think TCU fans are like, yeah, man, that's great. We're going in the right direction. Awesome. So after right, a let's... vibe check, got a literal vibe check. I appreciate that, Parker. That was good. <laughs> no, that sounds pretty good. Uh, let's talk about some games, Parker. So we have Oregon traveling across the country to go play uh, Georgia. Um, I believe it's in Atlanta. Georgia's a 16 and a half point favorite. Actually, the market looks like they're moving a little bit towards uh, Oregon. Uh, totals 53 and a half. Do you have any opinions on this game? Yeah, uh, this is a game that I, I, I think that Georgia is quite a bit better than Oregon. I know that they lost a lot on defense. They, they lost some of those receivers on offense, but they also lost a lot coming into 2021. And the way that they, they did their offense last year really set up Stetson Bennett to just toss the ball to big wide receivers. And this year they're just going to set him up to toss it up to big tight ends. So a lot of leeway for their offense. I think this year, one, one reason that I'm skeptical of this game uh, of betting Georgia in this game is we saw them last year do the minimum to win and then turn it off. Think about the Arkansas game. They scored on like the first three possessions and then they just cruised. And Oregon I think is, is, younger and um, maybe a little more hungry in terms of we, we really want to get those reps. We want to play 60 minutes, whereas Georgia says, hey, we just want to win, get the resume item, move on to the SEC schedule. I'm worried about a backdoor cover for Oregon here just because 17 or 16 and a half is so much. Um, and Georgia has been shown to kind of take their foot off the uh, foot off the pedal uh, as they have a lead, as they slow down the offense, as they minimize variance. So I'm, I'm reading between the lines here. You're just super into a Bo Nix negative game script narrative here. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I just have that image of him uh, against LSU, just running back and forth across the field six times and then throwing a touchdown. Just yeah. can't escape it. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, one big thing to look at is, I mean, Oregon's Oregon's rushing defense. I mean, their defense overall, but especially with some of their injuries and, and the way that Utah was able to exploit them, their rushing success rate. I have them at 93rd in non-garbage time last year, um, uh, 90th in points per echo points per quality possession. That's that I look. So they're gonna they're gonna have to show me something on defense for me to be confident in betting them to cover here. Uh, a bet on Oregon to cover is a lot more of a bet against Georgia, just putting their neck putting their foot on the neck of Oregon for 60 minutes than it is any kind of faith in Oregon being physical or, or being able to stop Georgia's uh, rushing attack. So it sounds like this is more of a stay away for you. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't have a strong, I don't have a strong lean here. Um, the, 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 yeah, just, just um, doesn't, don't see a lot of value in like 16 and a half, 17 points on week one between two, two power five schools. We'll see what bonus can do in his return. Uh, the long way to return to the SEC that we were all waiting for uh, for so <laughs> long. We got Utah at Florida also on Saturday. Utah, two and a half point favorites. Uh, the total year is 51 and a half. And interesting year for Florida. We get a full year of Anthony Richardson at quarterback. Let's go back to last year. What did you see out of him last year? And did you what you saw inspire confidence for Florida this year? Enough so to potentially bet them against Utah? Or what's your read on this game? Yeah, I, I think that looking at what Florida wanted to do last year was kind of a situation where um, they, I'm trying to be diplomatic, they had a coach <laughs> last season who had some very strong normative commitments about what a quarterback in his offense should do and wasn't necessarily able to cater the offense to the quarterbacks that he had on his roster. Whereas Billy Napier, you look at what he did with Levi Lewis at Louisiana year one, Levi Lewis trying to throw that deep ball was kind of erratic, wasn't really good at it. The next year they brought his A dot way back 
and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to ask you to do some different things. We're going to move you around. We're going to play action boot a little bit and, and give you some space. I think Napier is a, a lot more well-suited to kind of shaping an offense around Anthony Richardson rather than trying to put Anthony Richardson in a um, – Nick Fitzgerald size hole or something, whatever you whatever metaphor for a Dan Mullen quarterback you want to look at. Uh, not a not a huge sample size. So I try to think about quarterbacks in terms of base, right? And just say, hey, what's an average season? How many snaps do you have? That's how much I think about um uh uh deviating from that. Shout out to like Kevin Cole does that for draft position and quarterbacks. I like to do that with recruiting and quarterbacks. And um, and so you know, only only 74 dropbacks. Uh, w- one of those was kind of thrown to the wolves against Georgia, where it was just like, dude, we're just going to roll you out there and and see what happens. So I think that the upside for Anthony Richardson is a little more pocket presence than um, Emory Jones, a little less erratic decision making. So I won't necessarily say anything about their relative processing, but in terms of being wild and letting things spiral, I mean, he had five turnover worthy plays, 6.5%, like uh, Four of those were against Georgia and LSU, really, really good defenses. He was really young. I don't think he's going to be anywhere near as erratic. And so you start to talk about a vision for Florida. You say an offense tailor-made for a quarterback who's going to not minimize um, uh, who's going to minimize mistakes. And then on defense, you have a really, really athletic, a really high athletic floor. Uh, I don't, you know, don't know what they'll necessarily gel to be, but the athleticism is there. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys, are we sure that Utah is that much more physical than Florida? Are we sure about that? I mean, they, they look that way against Oregon last year, for sure. They um, did. They did. I just think that's something that's taken for granted. And Florida's like Florida's run, run defense, 76th in EPA per rush last season. Uh, a lot of that was, I hate to use the Q word about college athletes, but like a lot of that was some quit and some some early issues where they just got run over. I really think that Florida um, could could be surprisingly physical against Utah here. So Utah's getting a lot of love this this early preseason. I forget how high they were in the <clears throat> preseason AP poll, but they were high. Uh, I presume a lot of that is uh, because Cam Rising co- took over the quarterback position and, and that that program really took off after a bad start last year. Are you buying the hype with, with the Utes? I feel like every year we get one of these teams. It was like 2020 Iowa State. This year it's 20, it's it's North Carolina State and it's um or excuse me, it's 2021 Iowa State. They thought that 2020 was going to carry over a ton of returning production. It's North Carolina State this year, it's Utah this year. I don't necessarily want to put them in that um in that realm, but I do think that what tends to happen between you know January 10th and uh September 1st, when no meaningful football is played, uh there is kind of an an, a, an attempt to uh, artificially raise the ceiling of a team. Do I think Utah is very good? Yes. I have them more in that like nine win range than I do flirting with the playoff. One of the big reasons for that is my model rewards early down passing. That is how the modern elite of college football wins games, right? That's how your Ohio state and your Alabama are, 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 are winning games. They're going to pass. Um, and, and if you let them run against you, like or if you can't physically stop them running, they're going to do that. But they have that ceiling of being able to pass Utah 51st in EPA per pass, uh, 24th in passing success rate. Their passing game was not very explosive. They were ninth and third and fourth down success. So a lot of that came late, came from Cam Rising, kind of running around, extending plays with his legs. I need to see more from the pass offense because Utah is not going to be able to line up and just run, run their way into the playoff. They're going to have to find uh, some, some passing to uh, distance themselves from opponents and avoid stumbling. And so we're skeptical walk- of Utah broadly. Is it enough where you can talk yourself into Florida plus two and a half, or is it more so a hesitancy to lay the two and a half with Utah in what is not a super, super easy spot? I almost would feel better if Utah was, a, I feel better betting Kyle Whittingham if he was a dog in this game. Um, I don't think Florida and and, and points is indefensible here. You got to think about the humidity. You got to think about traveling across the country. You've got to think about the swamp as an environment um, and a really difficult road environment for for whatever that means. I I could see this being close, especially because, uh, you know, Billy Napier's Louisiana teams ran as much as anybody last last year. I imagine they'll try and run here 75th for Florida in rush rate over expected last season. That'll only increase. And Utah was 71st in rush rate over expected. So you could see, you know, slow game, Utah loses its legs at the end just because of a little bit of it's hot, it's Florida, it's swampy, uh, literally and metaphorically. I, I think Florida covering in a close game is not uh, is not an unreasonable bet here. Excellent. Uh, let's move on to Ohio State and Notre Dame. Uh, so this spread is Ohio State 17 and a half right now. I'm pretty sure I saw 14 and a half not too long ago. So big move there. 
you have so many narratives. Ohio State with uh, presumably one of the most amazing offenses, but what's going to happen on the defensive side of the ball? Uh, Notre Dame's going to probably bring an amazing defense, but don't really know what they have on the offensive side of the ball and new head coach. What, what are you seeing with these two teams? So uh, a friend, a friend sent this to me and I'm totally ripping it off of him, but uh, 17 and a half year, Ohio state could score 42 points. Do, do we think Notre Dame with a first time quarterback and, and not a lot at wide receiver is going to be able to put 24 on a Jim Knowles defense? Obviously there's some talent maybe that they want to arrange better on uh, Ohio state's defense subside of the ball, but still Jim Knowles is as good at anybody at, um, at game planning at disguising pressures and really, um, uh, putting his guys in a position to succeed. You look at the level of talent that he had at Oklahoma State and the way those guys developed. I mean, Malcolm Rodriguez might start as a first-year rookie kind of out of nowhere for, for the Lions. Just some excellent talent there. And uh, Ohio State, of course, obviously has those athletes. Um, the, the flip side is the one big weakness for Ohio State's defense was pass coverage. Notre Dame last year wasn't wasn't really thriving on the pass. Um, they they really high really high success rate, but lower EPA. So not a lot of explosive pass from them. Not no run game to speak of. I think that we're we're looking at a season where Marcus Freeman is trying to show proof of concept and showing that the floor has not fallen out with Brian Kelly leaving. Um, I, I, so I like Ohio State in this spot. I liked it at fourteen. I bet it at fourteen uh, a couple weeks ago. I think someone. Someone on our show earlier today commented that they got in like 11 in earlier this spring. And so I love that 17 and a half, especially with the hook makes me nervous. Um, a backdoor cover isn't out of line for Notre Dame, especially because kind of similar to what I was saying about the other game, we talk about game script with Georgia and Oregon, Notre Dame's going to have a lot more to play for, I think in this game. Um, and so there could be, I mean, 17 is just a whole lot of points, especially with the number of possessions that a quick scoring Ohio state defense is going to have. Um, I, I, I would lean towards believing in the backdoor cover. Um, but we're going to learn a lot about what kind of season Notre Dame is going to have pretty quickly here. Notre Dame's fifth in the preseason AP poll from what you were saying about Marcus Freeman. It sounds like you, you, you think that's a little bit too high. Yeah, I do. I do just because it's, it's, like I like Tommy Reese. I like Marcus Freeman. I think that they've got a good vision, but you know, that neither of them have been elite coaches at, in terms of total program development. And so I would almost give Brian Kelly a longer leash there to say, Hey, you've got some turnover in your program, but you know how to ease that in. Uh, Marcus Freeman for, for as great as he is a defensive mind and how smart he is, right. He's still going to learn about what it means to be a coach and what it means to be a coach in one of the most scrutinized positions in college football. So Got to adapt for some learning curve there. I think just uh, with a lot of turnover, that 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 really makes me um, a little bit nervous. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he he was Purdue's linebacker coach in 2015. So meteoric rise, yeah. and, and he certainly deserves it with what he's done at Cincinnati. But I think there's there's a lot on his plate this year. For sure. And uh, no tougher tests than going to uh, uh, Columbus for that first game. We'll see how they do in that one. Okay, let's open up the board here, Parker. Any other games standing out to you as being good betting values for this week? Week number one in college football. Um, I love SMU covering 11 versus North Texas. I know that's crazy to hear to hear um, a TCU guy say, I love SMU in this spot. <laughs> but um, uh, SMU has won six out of the last seven games. They would have covered 11 points in every single one of those games except the loss. The loss was when Chad Morris left and Sonny Dykes' first year, late transition, not a lot of structural continuity. Here you get Rhett Lashley, who's familiar with SMU, having been the offensive coordinator there. You get uh, Tanner Mordecai, one of the more talented quarterbacks in the nation, returning Rashi Rice, a really, really explosive wide receiver. Um, last week, UNT really one-dimensional on defense. They tried to pressure Gavin Hardison and UTEP. Uh, he beat them long a couple times. They shifted to dropping eight and gave Hardison time to work. UTEP just doesn't have the receivers to, to find anybody underneath. SMU is going to their schemes, going to have layers. I think this would get pointsy and out of hand. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see this move in SMU's favor um, as, as well. The total 68.5, uh, I think that comes down to more of what you think that uh, UNT is going to do. I'm not super optimistic. The way they played last week, they had two short field scores. I discount that in my model just because – um, that's, that's really not something the offense controls. And you look at, you know, they had the fumble on the goal line and 
UTEP dropped a touchdown. UTEP had two scoring opportunities where they got zero points combined. Um, some things outside of North Texas's control kind of helped them. I had that game closer to like 26-21 in terms of my model. And so I think SMU could absolutely boat race uh, North Texas here. 11 points seems like an easy barometer for, for them to get by. It does sound like, too, you might be looking towards potentially a team total uh, under on North Texas, potentially, if that situation that's not up at FanDuel right now, but uh, could be an outlet for you as well. So SMU minus 11 and a half standing out here for Parker. Ed, you mentioned Clemson last week, uh, minus 21 and a half. It's now minus 22 and a half. Before we head out, I did want to let you, or, you know, give you the floor, too. Any um, games standing out to you for week number one besides that Clemson game? Yeah, I mean, one game I'm finding interesting, and, and I got sent out to my newsletter is uh, actually Old Dominion plus seven and a half at home uh, against Virginia Tech. So I have this, I have Virginia Tech favored, but only about four and a half points. Um, Virginia Tech is, you know, kind of starting over, uh, getting rid of Justin Fuente and and uh, and and bringing in and Brett Pry there, and uh, you know, Old Dominion. I'm not really convinced that Hayden Wolf. He came in in the middle of last year, and I'm not convinced. You know, looking at the numbers, I'm not convinced that they're going to be great, but they they're certainly going to be better um, than their season long numbers suggest. And um, yeah, Parker's giving me faces, so I'd like to know what he what he thinks about that game. Oh, I'm also looking. I'm fascinated by that. Didn't Old Dominion's offensive coordinator stepped away like yesterday? I mean, like two. It was like two weeks ago now at this point. But I know. I had that one flagged for two reasons in the opposite direction. Cause, cause I, 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 um, I had, I love disagreeing. This is great. One of us is going <laughs> to be victorious at the end of this. Uh, I think Grant Wells was hurt at Marshall last year, a lot more than, um, okay. than it was, was known. There were some times where they looked really bad on offense. He's healthy this year. Um, I think that he's actually a, 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 maybe a step up at quarterback for them. Um, and the flip side, old dominion with that turnover as well. Uh, I think there'll be a, a little bit of a rough start is there. So I actually like the opposite on that game um, just because more, more of the off field stuff there. And I think that um, the, the defense for Virginia tech was, was better than, than kind of the perception last year. Uh, probably as a defensive guy, I think they'll be able to, to stifle old dominion pretty well, especially because old dominion's value a lot came through rushing the ball. What, what, what number did, what, what did your model have the number um, at? Yeah, so, sorry. That was my face. I was looking at the screen because I was uh, scrolling for the to make sure that there was the right offensive coordinator that had left. Um, I have this at uh, Old Dominion. Where is it? Is that a weeknight game? It is a uh, Friday game. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was in the wrong. I was in the wrong folder. Um, Old Dominion is going to be at the bottom. This is great podcasting. I apologize for this. <laughs> I think the oh video God. of you like. Of you like zeroing in on the computer is good though. I, I like yeah, this. For sure. This is good. This is good, like yeah, on the, visual medium. On the Bet US show, Gary and Kyle like all the time just send me screenshots of my face looking weird while they're like talking because I'm looking up something. I have unfortunate um, screen caps all the time. It's it's a thing. Yeah. Here we go. I'm in the right thread. I apologize. I need an intern. <laughs> um <laughs> me too. Get an intern. <laughs> Yeah, I sh honestly, I'm, I should just do that. Okay, I have this closer to, I would bet this at 10 and a half for Virginia Tech. Um, I have this like 12 points. Uh, the wow. big deal for me there is offensive success rate, uh, 91st for Old Dominion last year, 102nd in passing. Um, and uh, if you look at how their offense functioned, uh, 111th in points per echo against a pretty weak schedule, 11th in field position. So they were often in a plus situation and could not finish those drives very well. 101st on early downs EPA, 38th on third and fourth down success. So when you have a split on early downs and late downs, I really, really discount teams for being bad on early downs and good on late downs against a bad schedule because that's not very sustainable going forward. So um, I, I don't I don't know that Old Dominion's offense is going to be able to um, compete with Virginia Tech's defense. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, my numbers, they were definitely in the hundreds in the offense uh, with adjusted success rate. And it looked like, you know, they hit some big plays when they're on that winning streak with Wolf. So, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it all shakes out. Bad early downs, great <laughs> um, late downs was like the, the Chargers like 
recipe last year. And uh, I think that being skeptical, that makes a lot of sense. We'll see who emerges in the battle of uh, the battle of covering the spread for this week with Old Dominion versus Virginia Tech. We got Notre Dame, Ohio State. Uh, we've got Oregon, Georgia, and we're out here talking Old Dominion, Virginia Tech. I got to love that. Check out Parker on Twitter at Stats O War. Make sure you check out his website too, cfb grasscom and check out his other betting insights, Bet US, the college football show over on YouTube. Parker, we should appreciate the time. Good luck to you this week, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. Yeah, guys, appreciate being on here and you guys having me. Always happy to chat. And uh, yeah, best best of luck with your with your bets this weekend. Enjoy the uh, enjoy the slate. Thank you. And we also wanted to give a big thank you to Dr. Ed Fang. Find him on Twitter at the Power Rank at thepowerrank.com. Ed, appreciate it. Good luck to you in week one as well. Thank you very much. And where, where can people um, find all your stuff? Like your, you're talking about your, the, the member pick that the, you sent out, where can people get all that? Yeah. So the, the sports betting newsletter is at uh, the power Check that out. But uh, this week is actually the 2022 preview series on the football analytics show. So we do a daily episode. I do a few, uh, Edward DeGrasse does a few, and uh, it's a really good way to kind of dig in uh, for the season. We cover both college and NFL. Uh, I've given my three overrated teams for college football on Monday. You probably guess what one of them was based on the conversation <laughs> uh, during the show. Um, but I've actually have six years worth of data and uh, I get about two and three right over that time period. So uh, check that out at the football analytics show. You can get that wherever you get your podcast and you can also find it on YouTube. Alrighty, and find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J I M S A N N E S. Make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread. We are now once again daily, and we'll have NFL shows coming up next week. Another MLB show coming up on Friday to get you into your weekend. Have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you all once again tomorrow on Friday to close out the week on a high note with some Major League Baseball. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 